Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And on behalf of myself, Alice, and all of the folks involved in the Bible Talk ministry, we want to welcome you once again to another Bible study as we continue on in the letter to Paul's letter to the Ephesians. We're glad you can join us. Yes, pray, we are. Pray that this blesses you. I pray that you will test all that you hear and that you will hear from God, not yes. just from us. All right? Amen. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. You gotta hear, you gotta hear from the Lord. All right, as I said, we're continuing on. We're in chapter five of Ephesians. And we're going to pick up, we left off last week talking about husbands love your wives. Uh, and that's where we'll start right after this. Father, I just thank you that we are able to gather. Lord, in this time, in this troubling time, Lord, of the coronavirus that's going around the world, where we have to stay distanced from one another, we thank you, Lord God, that we never have to be distant from you. Amen. That you are a very present and ever-present God. So, Lord, we just thank you that we can meet this way, that we can that we can gather. Gather in your word, in the name of your Son, Christ Jesus, Amen. Father. So, bless this time. In Jesus' name I ask, Father. Amen. Amen and amen. Amen and amen. All right. As I said, we're in Ephesians 5, and we left out talking about husbands love your wives. So that's verse 25 of the fifth chapter. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved That's where I the am, church. yes. Okay. So that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water and with the word. You know, you can use soap and water, but the, the thing that will cleanse you from the stain of sin, and the only thing that can cleanse you from the stain of sin, is the word of God, Amen. the shed blood of Jesus Christ. All right. The reason for that is, it says in 27, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. I'm sure you've heard that. Jesus is coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle. Yes. Amen. Yes. Where do spots and wrinkles come from? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> James, James talks about in the first chapter how pure and undefiled religion, okay, is keeping oneself unstained from the world. Yes, yes. What stains you is the world. That world out there is a very, very dirty place. It has been polluted by the transgressions of men. It is covered with the filth of sin. And that's what pollutes the world. Absolutely. It pollutes it. That's that's what it says in Isaiah 24, 5, right? Sin pollutes the earth, right? So how do you keep, keep yourself unstained? You have to be in the world, mm -hmm. but not of it. Right. It's how you participate in the world, how close you get to it. That's the, that's the question and that's the problem more often than not. You know, I, I see that so much... Um, Particularly, and I'm going to talk about this, and I, 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 this will probably get some response. <laughs> so many Christians here in the United States, I know in England and other countries, are so wrapped up and involved in politics. And, you know, it, it, they're so divided. People ask me, do you get involved in politics? And I say, I just don't swim in that cesspool. Mm -hmm. And it is a cesspool. It truly, truly is. It is a dirty, dirty thing. Well, so if that upsets you, you need to take a breath, deep breath, get together with the Lord, spend some time in prayer about it, right? We're ambassadors for Christ. That's right. Now, I've lived in other countries, and living in other countries, I had to be obedient to the, to the, to the laws of the land. Mm -hmm. I had to obey the speed limits. I had to pay taxes. I had to do all. But, you know, the fact is I didn't get to vote. Because my, I didn't have, I lived in, we lived in Central America, we lived in England, we lived, I mean, the thing our is, citizenship our is citizenship, it says in Philippians 3.20, is in heaven. We're heavenites. Heaven heavenites. <laughs> We're heavenites. Hallelujah. So, it's just, you, when you get involved in these things, it's a dirty process and it's going to, it's going to put dirt on you. That's all I can tell you. 
You'll be stained by it. You'll be stained by it. Where do the wrinkles come from? Okay, I'll tell you. <laughs> if you were to lay a, a, a perfectly flat piece of paper on a perfectly flat table, it has no wrinkles in it. Unless it's been ironed. And it, you iron your paper? No, not a paper tablecloth. <laughs> okay, a tablecloth. Yes. So what would be a wrinkle? A wrinkle, the only way you have, uh, if you put a, a, a tablecloth on here, a wrinkle would have to be something that is raised up. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay? The wrinkles are the things in our lives that are raised up. It's pride. It's pride. Mm -hmm. And God wants to press that pride out of us because he is the only one who is worthy of all honor and praise and glory. Amen. And, and pride is insidious. It's so easy to allow into your life. But the simple fact of the matter is that we are to submit to God, humble ourselves, and all the rest takes care of itself. That's what Peter says. That's right. The devil will flee from us. Submit to God, resist the devil, and, and he, he will, will flee. flee from us. Right. That's how you get to be holy and blameless, is by getting the, the dirt, the filth, and the wrinkles, the pride out of your life. Okay? But that takes the Holy Spirit and the power of the Spirit of God in your life. But that power is there. It is there for you to have. So husbands ought to also love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. Well, I guess I love me pretty darn good because I sure like you a lot. And vice versa. Okay. And vice versa. Okay. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. Just as Christ also does the church. He, he cherishes, cherishes us. I mean, you know, I, I don't think we get it an awful lot because we're too much of Christianity is wrapped up in fables and, and tall tales and rituals and relics. And you think it's just about this. The, the, it's a love affair. It's a love affair. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He loved it's a, and it's a passionate love, i got to tell you. It really is. He nourishes us. How does he nourish us? Read Psalm 23. Have you never read Psalm 23? What was the command that Jesus passed on to the apostles, said to Peter? Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. He nourishes us. What nourishes us? Thy word was found and I ate it. It became for me the joy of my and the light of my heart. That's what Jeremiah said. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. God, he's nourishing us right now because the spirit of God wants to speak to us right now. Life-giving food. Because we are members of his body. You're not members of a, a denomination. You're not members of a congregation. You're members of his body. We are. If you're a member, it's a member of a country club. Country if, clubs have membership. Yeah. Right. For this reason, it says in the next verse, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. You know that marriage, that bond of marriage, changes every other relationship. Yes. Well, I don't think that most people do. It doesn't appear that they it does, right? I know, I mean, I, I, I would say that I love my mother and father. But the fact is, when I got married, that relation changed, and my relationship became the, the relationship in my life, the only natural one, was Alice and I. That's right. I'm, I'm going to say this. I, you know, I loved my mother very much. I had a really great relationship with my mother. And my mother had a great relationship with me. Mm -hmm. And my mother liked Alice a lot. Until she realized that I was going to move off and, and live with Alice and not with uh, you know them anymore. And Because you were an only child. I, I was an, I, yeah, I was an only child. Hallelujah, I got a big family now. But the, the point is that at some point when it became imminent that I was going to leave her and that circle and be joined to Alice, she started to get little niggly things in there. Started, and I said to her one day, I said, Mom, I, I need to tell you something. 
I said, don't ever, don't ever put me in a position where I have to choose between you and Alice. Because I promise you, you will not like the choice that I make. Now that sounds harsh. It wasn't harsh. It was factual. And I want to tell you something else. My mother had came to that and accepted that and rejoiced in that. For years, when my mother was alive, everybody thought that my mother was her mother. That's they had such a great, great, great relationship. Yeah, because it's not a competition. Uh -uh. It builds on each other. But it's you need different. to understand. The relationships are different. Relationships change in Christ Jesus. That's right. Now, Alice and I have been married, as we were filming this, over 52 and a half years. And we have basically celebrated our anniversary every month for 52 and a half years. Mm -hmm. But in the first years, we were not saved. Although we knew that God had put us together. Absolutely. That's, that's an interesting thing, but it was true. But after a few years, Alice got saved, and then I, a month later, I got saved. I can remember the first anniversary card I sent to Alice. And I quoted from the Song of Solomon. And I said, how beautiful is your love, my sister, my bride. See, Alice is not only my bride, she's my sister, my sister in the Lord. Mm -hmm. That's not, that, you, you, people who don't have the spirit of God could never understand that. You know, the natural man does not accept the things of the spirit of God because they are spiritually appraised. But the simple fact of the matter is, I mean, one of the greatest days of my life after getting saved was a day that my father became my brother. Yeah. Because I admit, he, you know, he was a religious guy, but he didn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ at the end of the day. So I was sharing the gospel with him and sharing the gospel with him. And before he died, I mean, just before he died, he accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And when he did that, my father became my brother. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I mean, and like Al said, I'm, you know, I was an only child. It's a joy for me to have so many brothers and sisters. Yes. I think a lot of people don't appreciate that. Don't appreciate their brothers and sisters. I do. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. I hope that you do. And I hope you understand that the most important relationship in your life, if you're married, is you and your wife, or wife, you and your husband. That's right. Listen to what I'm going to say, and we're going to look at this in a second. Not your children, mm -hmm. your husband. Not your children, your wife. Your husband comes second. Jesus comes first. Yes, but your husband Jesus. comes before your children. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because that, that relationship is going to go. I mean, it's like with my parents. Mm -hmm. Okay, it changes. You have to leave them. I mean, one of the, I, I see it as problematic so often that... You know, parents have their, their children get married and they want to keep those children and they want to just make them continue to... No, they have their own family. They have their own re lives and their own responsibility. That doesn't mean they can't see you. That doesn't mean they can't love you. They can't fellowship with you. But you need to understand they are in a new relationship. Your, your responsibility to them is finished at that point. Well, listen, uh, uh, somebody brighter than I said, this mystery is great, mm -hmm. but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself. And the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. That's a biggie. Well, I see an awful lot of wives. It doesn't seem as though they respect their husbands. They gossip about their husbands. They put them down all the time. I mean, what? Complaining about them. Yeah. Would you be surprised if I told you that that word there for respect in the Greek is like fear, hmm. like the fear of the Lord. Oh, okay. Are you, wives, do you have any awe of your husband? Well, you should be treating him like you would Jesus Christ. And husband, do you give your wife reason to stand in awe of you? Yes. Are you that man of God in that household that your wife can look at and see Christ living in you? Yeah. Because... If she can't, you both have a problem. Get, a, get before the Lord so he can fix it. Amen. All right, I'm going to move on to chapter 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. 
why, why are you, what should I say? This is right. Because if you're not, that's wrong. Mm -hmm. And you need to understand that it's wrong. Do we live in a time when children are disobedient to their parents more greatly than other times? Yes. <laughs> you know, in, in Psalm 50, God talks about the fact that because they wouldn't endure, wouldn't accept discipline, that they cast his word behind them. Psalm 50. Psalm 50, yeah. So we need to love discipline. Why would you love discipline? Because it is a blessing in your life. It corrects you, it teaches you, it strengthens you. We should be seeking discipline. So children need to be taught to obey their parents. And then it goes on and says, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, which it is, by the way. There's a difference between honoring and obeying. I mean, you can obey out of fear, all right? Yes. Yes. Uh, I'm, most people that I know that do keep the speed limit, and they are few and far between, mm -hmm. because they don't recognize the fact that when they disobey the speed limit, they are disobeying God. But that's another story. But the simple fact of the matter is, you you need to obey that. I mean, you. But you need to honor. You need to honor your father and mother. Yes. How do you honor them? Well, it goes back to holding them in awe. Speaking well of them. You know, I, I was so touched because when I first got saved back in the mid-1970s, I used to listen to one radio. They used to have, that was a common thing. that They had 15-minute radio shows, Christian radio shows. And there was one fellow uh, who was a, a doctor, a, a president of a small Christian college. Mm -hmm. And King. King's College, mm -hmm. yeah. And... It was so common for him to talk about how he would wake up in the night and hear his father praying for him. Mm. And this man, he was so in awe of his father. He, he so honored his father all the time because of how he respected his father as a man of God. So I got to ask you, fathers, do your children respect you as a man of God? Mm. I mean, you know, you can't force them to do that. But you can certainly... You can take action that will destroy any possibility. They need to see Christ in you. Your wives need to see Christ in you. Then God will deal with them if they're not giving you the honor that you should have. I'm going to, verse 4 there. Chapter 6, verse 4. Chapter 6, verse 4. Interesting. It says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. How do you bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord? Well, I can tell you how you don't do it. You don't bring them up in the instruction of the Lord by putting them on a school bus every day and sending them off to the world mm -hmm. to be trained in the ways of the world. Now, this is a pet subject with me. I mean, we don't even have children, but I've been involved in Christian education a lot. The simple fact of the matter is, what does a government school here in the United States of America have to teach but the ways of the world? That's all they know. And quite frankly, now they are, they are teaching ungodly principles. I mean, you send your child there, they're going to learn all of the ungodly stuff that they shouldn't be learning. Get your kids out of there. You will answer for that. You will answer for those children. You know, we have, we've started and run Christian schools. And I used to be, when I started, you know, I was a pastor in the first year I was a principal. And I used to interview parents and children who were coming in to apply to go to our school. It started out basically as a co-op home school. It was the parents bringing their own children in, but we set it up as a regular school. The school was so blessed, I promise you. Mm -hmm. But parents would come and during the interview process, I would say to these parents, most of whom were all Christian, obviously, and they would say to me, I would say to them, you know, we'll never ask you to support our ministry. And that always got a quizzical look. Yeah. What do you mean? You're not, not going to ask Surprise. us to support your ministry? Yeah. I said, because it will never be our ministry to raise your children. We are here to support your ministry. Mm -hmm. Because it is your ministry to raise your children in the ways they should go. Train them up in the ways they should go. And you need to do that. There's an awful lot of children out there 
And it should be very obvious to anybody who's alive right now that they don't have any, no relationship with God. And I'm talking about a real relationship that is evidenced. Okay. And it, it is such a blessing to be around children that know and have a relationship with the Lord. They are just so wonderful to be around. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, we used to take these children on field trips and it never failed. And when we went on field trips, I'm talking about like St. Augustine over the, the Cape uh, Kennedy. Mm -hmm. People would always come up to us and talk about how well behaved the kids were, what a, what a blessing it was to see kids acting like that. Yeah. Well, that's because they were being brought up in the ways they should go, I'll tell you why. Is this an important thing? I mean, should I spend time talking about this? Well, let me see. In, in the Gospel of Matthew, a man came up to Jesus one time and said, what is the foremost command? What's the most important command? And Jesus said this, I'm gonna read it from, Deuteronomy chapter 4. Verse 6, eh? That's in there. I'm going to start it. I'm sorry, the other way around. Chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be in your heart. That's the foremost command. But don't let me stop there, because I need to read the next verse, which says, You shall teach them diligently to your sons, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Is that pretty well covering? I think so. You're responsible. You are responsible to speak the commandments of God, to be diligent teaching your children the ways of the Lord. Bring up your child in the ways he should go and they'll not depart from when it's old. The, the school superintendent is not gonna have to answer, well he may have to, but it's not gonna, he's not the one responsible to answer for the activities of your children. The pastor of your church is, you are. You've been entrusted with those children that's what the Word of God says, and I'm sure you know it. You are responsible. How much time are you dedicating to nurturing your children, to bringing them up in the ways they should go, to bringing them up in the Word of God? This is your responsibility. Not to put them on a bus back to Egypt so they can be trained in the world and the ways of the world, which the Word of God says, don't you do that. Because I, how far do you have to look to see how worldly the children are becoming? And I, I say children. I'm not just talking about little little children. I'm talking about, you know, teenagers. teenagers, late teenagers. They have learned everything wrong. Okay. It's important. When somebody said, what's the foremost command? That's what Jesus said. That's the command. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Well, I've lost me here. That's all right. You're, you're patient. Patience is the fruit of the Holy Spirit, so I know you can deal with this. Okay. He goes on and talks about slaves. We, we don't have slaves anymore. We have people that go to work, and some of them feel like they're slaves. But the fact is, whatever you do, you have to do it as unto the Lord, right? You know that, right? Yes. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the, to the flesh, with fear and trembling. In the sincerity of your heart as to Christ. Whatsoever you do, do is unto the Lord. You need to be treating your boss like you were God. What? If there's a problem, it's God's responsibility to deal with it. You can now you can have conversations with the Lord about your situations, but you better not be having you know conversations with everybody else. Okay. All right, I'm, I'm going to skip down here. With good will, render service as to the Lord and not to men. That's chapter 6, verse 7. you got to be doing what you do as unto the Lord, okay? Knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. 
you are sowing, and the way you sow is the way you're going to reap. You know, I'm sure, listen, these are verses I, I pray that you know, okay? This is this is pretty basic. It, it, well, it's all basic, yes. but do you see it out there on the... In, do you see it out there in the church? No. No. So we need to, these, these are the perilous last days. I'm telling you, we need to be prepared. We're going to talk about that next week. How do we get prepared for what's going on? Because I'm going to tell you something. I don't think that anybody in the world has a clear understanding of what is going on with this global pandemic. I really, really don't. So we're going to talk about that. And we're going to talk about, you know, let me, let me end on this. In verse 10. Because that's where we're going to start next week. Ephesians 6.10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. That's what we're going to talk about. And we're going to look at that in depth, okay? Because that's what you need to be doing. You need to be prepared for warfare. And you need to be putting on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. And that's what the American Standard Bible says here in the United States. The schemes. You know, in the King James and in England, they talk about the wiles. And I think wiles is it's talking about the methods, mm -hmm. but wiles is a better description of his methods than schemes. Yeah. Because wiles is generally applied to like feminine w women people trying to seduce you with their wiles, mm -hmm. right? Because Satan has no authority or power in your life. He has to convince you to give him what's rightfully yours. He has to seduce you into doing yes. what God doesn't want you to do. He has no power. He has no power. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. So bear that in mind. Listen, pray about this. Share this. Think about it. Spend time in it during the week. God has something, that, a lot more to say to you than I do. Praise God. So Father, I just thank you, Lord God. That wisdom stands in the street and shouts. That, that you roar from Zion. So, Lord, that, there's, that you desire for us to know. Not to, be, not to be ignorant of your plan. Father, help us to draw nearer and nearer to you. To grow closer and closer and closer. To be more and more like your son, Christ Jesus. We just praise you and thank you for all that you've done in our life. For all that you're doing in our life and for all that you are yet to do in our lives. Help us to be faithful witnesses to your love and the power of your love in this evil day and age. In Jesus' name I ask, Father. Amen. Well, until next week, and be back next week, all right? And you remember, you can write to us at office at BibleTalk.com with any suggestions, comments. Just to say hi. Just to say hi. Let us know where you're watching from. So till then, God bless you and goodbye. Thank Jesus.